Hello, okay, so today we're going to be taking a look at the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus 1. This is a very important theorem. You'll be seeing it all throughout your calculus career, so you know it's like really important that you learn it. All right, so let's read it. If f is continuous on a, b, then the function g is defined by, okay, g of x is the antiderivative of x of, of f of, of f of t, sorry, and is continuous on a, b, and differentiable, then the derivative of g of x is f of x. This makes sense because if the antiderivative of f of, like, you know, f of x is g of x, then we just go the other way around. We're just, you know, hopping back and forth. It's like when we hop back and forth between velocity, acceleration, and position. We have that ability due to the relationship between between derivatives and antiderivatives. That's what this does. It makes that relationship for us. We can solve all types of problems with it. Okay, so the type of problems I will be guiding you through today. I'm going to be doing the basic plug-in problem. I design these problems, you know, they, they build off with difficulty, then a plug-in with differentiability, then we're going to do a plug-in with manipulation of the integral, and lastly, I designed a lovely FRQ that will give you a conceptual approach with a graph that you would typically see on an exam, possibly, or the AP exam, or a quiz, or any homework problems. Okay, so of x, you know what that means, you're a calculus student, the derivative, and then we have from 0 to x of y sine root y d of y. Now you're probably thinking, what? What do I do? Well, don't worry, I'm going to show you. So this problem might seem a little scary because you're thinking, what? Like, I don't know how to, like, I can't use sub this. I can't, you know, take the derivative, integrate it, whatever I'm supposed to do. Well, you know, you're supposed to derive it right here. So all you have to do in this problem is plug it in. Here you have, you plug in x for y. Sorry, the handwriting got a little sketchy there. You know, we all have rough days. So here we go. x sine of root x. There's your answer. All right, that was a pretty basic problem. You know, you should be able to do that in your sleep. It's pretty, pretty basic. Why don't we, why don't we move on to a little bit, perhaps more complicated of a problem? So we have derivative from the integral zero to e to the x cosine cubed of t d of t. Now let's just, you know, use the same basic thing we did last time. Cosine cubed. All we're doing is plugging this in. We're going back to that thing we talked about. That, you derive this, you get this. That's why you can plug this into that. It's all making sense now with these problems. So cosine cubed, e to the x, we're changing it. We're just plugging this number into there. Just for your information, you will not get, in this calculus class, you will not get two differentiable functions right here. That's not going to happen to you. Don't worry. So cosine e to the x. Well, I bet you thought you were done. Well, if you did think that, you would be wrong. You need to, don't forget, you have to multiply by the derivative of this. That's so easy to forget. So common on tests. You don't want to be missing any points. Multiplying, ooh, some lead there. Got to get some 0.8 lead in there. So you want to multiply by the derivative. So not you. it might be easy to think that just that's your answer. Do not forget to multiply by the derivative. That's why I stated in the previous problem, even if it's just the derivative of one, you want to write it out so you get into good calculus habits. Because we want to do the Because this derivative is this function, therefore that's why we can just plug this in. It's a very amazing theorem, if you ask me. Okay, why don't we take a look at number three. So now you're probably, let's, let's read the problem. D over D of X is one, one, that's, you know, freaking me out a little. The other, the other ones were zero. One, so 2 minus 3x to 1, well, you're thinking, what? I want this up here. Well, don't worry. We'll, we'll be able to get it up there. All you have to do, if you want to flip the integral thing, this doesn't even just, this can relate to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. you got to be comfortable, you know, manipulating your integrals. All you have to do is throw in that little negative sign, and there you go. Flipped your problem. That is what I want to see. Now, let's rewrite this. D of T, don't forget that D of T. I know it's easy to, cause you gotta show that this is with respect to T. You know what I mean? You can't, cause if I wrote D of X, this whole problem would just be a mess. You know, we don't want that. So here you have the same problem right here. Now we're gonna do what we always do. Plug it in. Two minus three X. Oh geez, this lead Staples is just failing me here. Okay. Two minus three X squared over 2 minus 3x minus 1. Before we do any 2 minus 1, let's just write it all out so we prevent any mistakes. Now, do not neglect this negative sign. I see far too often students just throw out these negative signs, myself included. We don't want to be doing that. So I, I like to almost just circle negative signs when I see them so I just don't forget about them. Let's throw that negative sign in there 
and I bet I bet you were forgetting that this is differentiable. What is the derivative of this? Pause for a second, think about it. You should know negative three. We got so let's multiply by negative three. Now you know you could clearly see these negative signs. They're going to cancel out. We're all good here. Now our final answer, we're gonna get three times two minus three x squared over two minus three x minus one. Now if you wanna get fancy, you could do two minus one. I mean, not that it's too fancy, but you know what I mean? I feel like sometimes, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta leave it in its basic form so it's very clear for a teacher grading for, or for yourself to see what you plugged in. You know, why make things more complicated? Ooh, there we go, okay. Here we got the answer to this problem. Just to do a basic review of what I've done on this page. We did a basic plug-in. Now we did a plug-in where it was more complicated because we had to make sure to multiply by this derivative. Remember, derivative e to the x, e to the x, you know that. You know, chapter four, we did all those chain rules. Now three, this one was where we had to flip the integral and multiply by the derivative. So in a way, we combined these two and added a little flare with this negative sign. So now I feel like you and I, I feel like we're both ready to attack a more complicated problem. Why don't we take a look at this FRQ? It's, a, it's just such a good FRQ if you ask me. Okay, so here we go with this FRQ. G of X is negative three to X, F of T, D of T. And we have this graph. This is a graph of F below. This is not a graph of G. So let's, let's just absorb the graph. You know, we're looking at it. We got some we got some derivative of zero here. Let's just, let's just think about that. Find g of negative three and estimate g of zero. Well, g of negative three, let's think about it. This is the, f is the derivative of g to the x. So if we wanna go back from derivative to antiderivative, we have to find area under the curve. It's just like when we find distance from the velocity graph. It's just like what we did our take a ride project. We all did the take a ride project, you know, that's how we did it. We found the area under the curve. So let's go back to that. G of negative three, if you wanna get real fancy, you know, you could write out your integral, negative three, negative three, write out all that fancy stuff. But why don't we just take it a step back and look at it visually? I, f I find that if you don't understand things conceptually, the visual is too difficult. So right here, if our thing is from negative three to negative three of our function, well, there's nothing here, that's, that's zero. It's very clear to see that g of negative three is zero. Very clear to me. But with zero, I'm finding things to be a bit more complicated. Perhaps that's just me. But let's, let's break it down. Let's, let's not make it too complicated. So we have g of zero. Let's think of it as two triangles. Let's think of it as one triangle right here and one triangle right there. Didn't that just make it easier for me? In my opinion, that just made it easier. Okay, let's keep going, we're running out of time here. Now, we have g of zero, we're gonna have this function, one times two, you know that, you know, base times height over two, that's three halves minus one. What do we know? That's one half. And I'm gonna write a little approximation, because I don't, I don't wanna say that it's exactly one half, because you know, we're estimating. Okay, we gotta pick up the face here. So now, where is G increasing? Think of this conceptually. Don't just always rely on tricks and this. You gotta actually know what you're doing. Well, where it's increasing, well, why would it be increasing here if you're, you're losing area here? Clearly, we're gonna be increasing here to here, increasing here to here, because that's where we're adding more area. You know what I mean? So let's write it out. Negative three to negative two, because think you're adding more area. Even though it looks like it's decreasing, you're still each time more and more areas being added. Areas losing, areas adding. Okay, here we go. Then you have zero to about, I would say that's around 2.8 in my opinion. Let's, we don't need to be too perfect here. Now, please indicate any R mins and R maxes. Well, if we think about this conceptually, a minimum, minimum, negative to positive. Where are we going negative to positive? In my personal opinion, and probably a lot of mathematicians' opinion, we're going negative to positive here. Think losing area to gaining area. Therefore, we have an R min at zero, zero. And an R max, do we have any R max? Well, I'll bet that we do. We have an R max at this spot right here, because think, we're going increasing to decreasing. That's here, we're adding area, now we're losing area. Here we have negative two, zero. And where's the other spot? Adding area, losing area. Here we got again that around 2.8 comma zero. 
Don't you just feel like you're really conceptually learning this? Okay, now please indicate any points of inflection. Points of inflection, this one's tricky. Think okay, so I ran out of time because it was going over 10 minutes, but basically what, when you want to find the point of inflection, you'll look at when f prime of x changes signs because since f of x is the derivative of g of x, you, to find the second derivative of g of x, you just look at the derivative of f of x. So where f pr prime of x changes signs, that's where you have a point of inflection.